And this is Steve Fryer, and you're listening to the Inner Light Program. I'm with Dr. Larry Dossey, who is a physician of internal medicine, formerly with the Dallas Diagnostic Association, and former chief of staff of the Medical City Dallas Hospital. After graduating with high honors from the University of Texas at Austin, he received his MD degree from the Southwestern Medical School in Dallas in 1967. And following an internship, he served as battalion surgeon in Vietnam, later completing his residency in internal medicine at the Veterans Hospital and Parkland Hospital, both in Dallas, Texas. Welcome to the Inner Light Show, Dr. Thanks. Dossi. It's a great uh, pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Uh, you're you're uh, author of five books, including uh, Space, Time, and Medicine, Beyond Illness, Recovering the Soul, uh, Meaning in Medicine, Lessons from a Doctor's Tales of Breakthrough and Healing, and your current book is Healing Words, The Power of Prayer and the Practice of Medicine. That's quite a quite a list of books, and I must admit I've been a fan of, of yours since your first book, Space, Time, and Medicine. I haven't read them all, but uh, I've been a fan, and I've uh, been rooting for you and and uh, waiting for your success. And I know recently I read an article somewhere that said you've been on over 100-some talk shows recently in the last couple of years. Well, it certainly seems uh, like that. I've been a busy boy living out of a suitcase in an airplane for about the past year and a half. Well, we appreciate this opportunity to have you on the show here in Chicago. Thank you. Um, I wanted to get started with a little bit of uh, background. We know you're trained as an AMA-style medical doctor, and, and uh, uh, since writing the books, uh, you've uh, sort of moved into what I would almost call a uh, ministry, uh, touting the, the benefits of prayer. That's, now, that's quite a, a transformation from that first book, uh, space, time, and medicine, because in that book you, you didn't mention prayer very much. Yeah, I don't think the word prayer ever came up in that book. When, when did this evolve into uh, a study of, of prayer? Well, it evolved very gradually. Uh, it certainly didn't occur overnight. My interest early on uh, as an internal medicine physician, even from the first earliest days of my practice, was in the role of consciousness, what can the mind, the attitudes, people's emotions do in terms of their health? Uh, I got into that area first because basically of some personal physical problems. Uh, I was afflicted uh, since the sixth grade uh, in childhood with severe migraine headache. This was very mm -hmm. incapacitating. And so I found my way into biofeedback, which is a way of learning to control your body through your thoughts. Uh, as a treatment for my problem, and it worked magnificently. I kept up with the uh, mind-body literature through the years, and out of that interest, uh, I went into the area that some people call parapsychology, uh, other people call it, uh, uh, well, sometimes not too flattering things in science, as a matter of fact, because people don't uh, line up very warmly in science to that general area. Mm -hmm. But one can't look at this whole area of basically how the mind can operate at a distance without getting into prayer. Prayer is an action at a distance. Uh, this is what we mean by intercessory prayer. And I was astonished, basically, to find over 130 studies that are out there in this general area, over half of which show that this distant prayer uh, business works. So basically, that's the way I got into it. I was fascinated by the data. I didn't know it existed, and uh, I began to pay attention to it. Were you? Uh, did you start experimenting with prayer on yourself or for others at first? Well, I uh, had an interest in prayer personally since childhood. I was raised in a part of the country in Central Texas, which mm -hmm. you know we 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 considered not to be the Bible Belt, but we considered Central Texas to be the buckle of the Bible Belt. <laughs> uh, so uh, I was immersed in this tradition of prayer growing up, but I threw all of that away uh, when I went to college, became a materialistically right. science-oriented type of person. You almost have to throw it away to, well, to be a scientist. Well, it's a survival uh, mechanism, really, mm -hmm. uh, sure. You, it's very difficult to hang on to that idea. But I began to uh, come back to this area of prayer late in my medical practice, back in the uh, mid-80s. And the reason I did is because, again, I came across very powerful studies which showed that prayer can save lives. It can make people healthier. And these were studies done in, in first-rate medical schools, 
uh, hospitals. And I began to think, look, Dossie, uh, if this science is good, and it certainly looks like it, you should be using this in your medical practice. So I began to diligently pray for my patients. You did? Yeah. Uh, I would have a ritual every morning when I uh, <laughs> went to my office. I'd go to my office earlier than usual. What did you do exactly? What did I do? Well, you got there early. <laughs> so that, that's, that's right away something unusual because most doctors probably get there late. Well, <laughs> <laughs> You're getting there early. I like that. Well, I did get there early. And uh, the ritual was one that I invented. It didn't resemble anything I'd ever saw in church. But I had to find my own private way of praying that seemed right for me. Uh, and this went beyond the formal approaches that I grew up with. For instance, in my office, I had a collection of uh, shaman's rattles that people had given me mm -hmm. through the years. And I would... Uh, burn incense and enter a meditative, contemplative, prayerful frame of mind, and I would shake my rattles and I would uh, engage in uh, 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 my own private thoughts, asking that for all of those patients I was about to see on hospital rounds and all of the patients I would see later that day in the office, I prayed that uh, the universes will be done for those uh, people and that the best possible outcome might prevail. Never once did I impose my ideas about what was best, right. and I didn't uh, spell it out. I, didn't, I never once prayed for any specific clinical event to happen, but like, it was this like removal of cancer done. or something like that. No, Nothing because I, I didn't feel comfortable with that. I know that's the way most people pray. Sure, uh, but I think that uh, the universe is fairly smart. I think the absolute God, goddess, however we mm -hmm. want to term the absolute, uh, the supreme being has all of that information about what's the best possible outcome. Right. And I don't think it's incumbent on us human beings to lay our trip on the universe. So that's that's the w reason I chose to pray in an open-ended sort of way. Well, you know, I uh, about a year ago I interviewed a man from the Spindrift Foundation, Mr. Bill Sweet, and we talked about the, uh, the quality of thought. And that's one of the discussions we got into uh, evidently, the Spindrift Foundation, which I, I know you're familiar with, their work um, got into measuring the different types of prayer. And maybe you could speak to that. Well, uh, actually, the Spindrift organization has been very uh, influential in my own thought about the scientific evidence for prayer. I think they have made a tremendous contribution in this whole area, and they don't get nearly as much credit as they deserve. Mm -hmm. uh, if any of their listeners are interested in contacting the Spindrift organization, which I heartily encourage, they can do so by phoning information in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. The Spindrift okay. organization is, is located in Fort Lauderdale. Basically what Spindrift did was over uh, almost two decades to do controlled laboratory experiments, uh, testing the power of prayer, testing to see if prayer works, in very simple biological systems. Now a simple biological system mm -hmm. might be the growth rate of of, of seeds or plants or bacteria or fungi, something that you can measure with complete precision, they answered uh, that question. They proved to my satisfaction that prayer does have a very definite effect in study after study. Then they went on to ask the next logical question, which was, look, if this stuff works, what type of prayer works better? What is the best prayer strategy to use? If you're going to pray, how best should you do it? And so they, specific or open-ended? Open-ended or specific. Mm -hmm. Their terms for this was directed prayer versus non-directed right. prayer. Directed prayer is where you attach a specific outcome or request to the prayer. Uh, oh, God, will you please give me a healing in my pancreas or, yeah, or, you or know, a new car or help whatever. Help win the lottery. You know, <laughs> That's give a me, big one. Give me a parking space, <laughs> this kind of idea. But uh, a non-directed prayer doesn't do that, and it simply follows the uh, thy will be done approach. So that's what you were doing when you made your rounds. How, how many years ago was well, that? Well, it was, uh, let's see, uh, over a decade ago, or about 10 years ago. And so what these Spindrift uh, researchers found was that although both methods work, and I think that's the bottom line, both methods are effective. In this particular series of experiments, it was this non-directed, open-ended approach that was significantly stronger or more powerful than the directed specific approach. 
In other words, the thy will be done approach seemed to set the stage for a greater effect in these experiments than if you spell it out. I was influenced by this. See, I'm a hopeless introvert, and I, I, I just sort of line up. Uh, <laughs> it makes sense. <laughs> You're on so many uh, media shows. <laughs> You're like yeah, there's me. There's a paradox there. There is. So uh, as an introverted, interdirected sort of contemplative person, I felt much better using this non-directed, thy will be done approach mm -hmm. uh, innately. It just suited who I was. And I think that there's a great lesson here for people. I, I think that the bottom line, again, is that both these methods work, and that's sort of nice because it lets people select their own prayer strategy according to their own temperament. It's not as if there's one formula, one right way that you could apply to everybody. There are no formulas here. The, a crucial aspect of all of these prayer studies, over 130 of them, is that is that you can take people of a great variety of religious persuasions into the laboratory, have them pray however is best for them, and you can show that a variety of methods work. There is not just one right way. This sort of universalizes this prayer business. It democratizes it. And that's one thing I really like about all of these studies in prayer. We're with Dr. Larry Dossie, who is the author of Healing Words, and he's here with us uh, on a special trip to Chicago. And we'll have more from Dr. Dossie, and we're talking about the power of prayer. We'll be right back right after this. You're listening to the Inner Light Program. I'm with Dr. Larry Dossie, the author of Healing Words and four other books on uh, the power of thought. Uh, Dr. Dossie's goal in all of his books is to anchor the so-called holistic health movement in a model that's scientifically respectable and which at the same time answers to man's inner spiritual needs. You know what's so amazing to me about this whole arena is the fact that you're here in Chicago, you're invited on many talk shows to talk about the power of prayer. Before this this idea came along, uh, I mean, you were writing books and all that, but you weren't quite as, uh, as sought after as a speaker. And I know uh, a little later today, 48 Hours will be here. Uh, you'll be on that show, and you've been on many other shows. What do you think is going on here? There's such... It seems to me such a shift that's taken place in the last year or two. Why are people so interested in spirituality and the power of prayer? I mean, it's been around forever, but why now? And, and, and you being a medical doctor is the most amazing thing to me, I guess. And maybe that's what the, the media is, is sort of uh, uh, interested in. Why are you interested in the power of prayer? Well, those are great questions, Steve. I'm not sure I understand uh, the answers completely. As a matter of fact, I'm certain I don't. But one thought I have about this is that our culture in the past 100 years has done its best to be scientifically oriented and intellectually respectable. And, and part of this has been getting rid of all of this soft, fuzzy, uh, inaccurate kind of stuff, uh, such as the spiritual, the transcendental, the higher, uh, and so on. And, and I don't care whether we like it or not, science in our culture has become the most powerful factor to define reality there is. It's almost a religion in itself, well, isn't it? Well, it is. It's the new church, uh, as a matter of fact. And so there has been very little room, precious little room within science to talk about prayer, uh, these concepts of the soul and spirit. And because we have eradicated these ideas uh, for so long in our culture at official levels, I think that people are starved for a reinfusion of the mm -hmm. spiritual element in their lives. And when somebody who honors science, as, as I do, uh, comes forth and says, look, we've had this wrong. There is a place in science for prayer. There's a place in science to talk about the soul and the spiritual side of things and to do this respectively and scientifically. Then people become interested. And I think what we're seeing is an increase in interest because we've become spiritually malnourished as a society, and people are ready to have that hunger met once again. Do you know of, of any other doctors uh, or scientists uh, that you've met in your travels and in your work that uh, believe the way you believe? Let me tell you, Steve, there's a ton of them. Uh, you don't know this because a lot of them are under a lot of pressure to be quiet and not step forward. They're in the closet. They're in the closet. <laughs> they are in the closet. I keep a uh, collection of letters I get from physicians around the country. Mm -hmm. 
And in the course of a year, I do have the opportunity to speak to a lot of medical schools and hospitals and really thousands of doctors. And so doctors write me, and they uh, say basically the same thing. They say, look, you know, we, we support your ideas by and large. There aren't many objectors out there who communicate with me. But they go on to say, you have to understand that if I stood up for what you did here in this medical school, I'd probably never get another research grant. I'd probably never get another promotion. And one physician actually said, this situation is killing me. So you see there are a lot of doctors out there who are under mm -hmm. a tremendous amount of pressure to be quiet and not answer and give voice to their spiritual needs. But those doctors are out there. And I hope that one of the results of this book on prayer uh, would be that it would encourage physicians to come forward, to take a stand, and to come out of the spiritual closet and to stand up for really what they believe. And I see that happening around the country. Now, that wasn't always the case. Uh, I could probably, uh, you could probably think back to the 40s, the 50s, and uh, the turn of the century. People were much more open about their spirituality, were they not? Exactly. And, and doctors would uh, go along with prayer, and they might even do some prayer for their patients. I think. Uh, when know, did 50, that change? Yeah, 50 years ago, it was not uncommon for physicians to pray at the bedside. But listen, you have no idea, unless you're involved in scientific organized medicine, the pressures mm -hmm. to not do that sort of thing. Uh, you see, it's all physical. It's the, all mechanical. There's no meaning to health and illness. It's all a matter of what your atoms and molecules are doing. And this may seem, uh, you know, overly dramatic to say things like that, and it sounds almost, uh, you know, uh, made up, but it isn't. And doctors buy this message, and so they begin at a certain point in their lives to think that it's a matter of... Uh, intellectual soft-headedness right. to admit to any of this stuff that involves prayer, spirituality, the soul, and so on. In a way, we're talking about uh, uh, an overgrown ego in the profession. It's as if, if I can't heal this person with my drugs and with my surgery and with my techniques, um, to, to pray is sort of like admitting failure. I have to give up. That's right. I mean, nothing else works, so we might as well use prayer, <laughs> that, that, that sort of thing. <laughs> Actually, I look forward to the day when uh, people put prayer not at the bottom of the list and look at it as a last resort, mm -hmm. but we elevate it to the top of the list. Well, I think there's a difference when you begin to understand prayer as a scientific activity. And uh, in the Church of Religious Science, of which I'm a member and a practitioner, and I know you were invited here to uh, speak uh, uh, because of them, um, we actually talk about prayer as a scientific modality. Uh, but it's, it's, I think that's hard for an AMA trained, uh, uh, doctor to understand that there might be a power that we call mind mm -hmm. that's transcendent and that actually hears and listens and responds to our thinking and to our feeling. So it makes sense if, if this is the most powerful force in the universe that, uh, we might as well go ahead and use it along with everything else that makes sense if we're trying to affect the healing. Well, I think that's a practical, common-sense approach. I completely agree with that point of view. I think a lot of doctors get their backs up over this because they think that, you know, if we start talking about prayer, that people are going to abandon their surgery and their, you know, chemotherapy and medications. Sure. And I actually had one cynic, uh, a skeptical doctor recently, to tell me that I should be quiet about prayer because I'm killing people. And I, they believe what, that. What, what do you mean? And he said, well, you're going to be seducing people away from good, solid medical treatment. Well, that's certainly nothing I've ever uh, uh, promoted. I, I think that if you've got an appendectomy, you better get it. I think if you've got appendicitis, you sure. better have an appendectomy. I've had one. Yeah, so <laughs> Saved my I. life. I'm sitting here because of that. Sure. But in addition to surgery, you can get prayed for, too. So we're not you know, selling prayer to the exclusion of the other things that doctors are good at. I think the other major thing is that doctors basically are just poorly informed about this area. Most physicians have no idea that there are any scientific studies out there looking at prayer, let alone over 130 of these things. And, and this is atrocious. I mean, so, this is an abysmal level of ignorance. I, I was, uh, a few years ago when I arrived in Chicago, I had a roommate who was studying to be a doctor at the Northwestern, one of the finest uh, training centers in the country. and. I remember he used to come home, and, and uh, if his girlfriend didn't cook for him, he'd have uh, Wonder Bread with sugar on it. <laughs> and, you know, his level of, of understanding on just simple nutrition was atrocious, you know. Wonder Bread with sugar. I, yeah. I haven't thought of that one. Oh, yeah. He looked uh, the part, too. 
A few years ago, I wrote an article called Voodoo in the Doctor's Office, and the idea being that a doctor says his patient has, say, six months to live. And uh, I know in, in uh, looking over your book that you had touched on this idea of black prayer or black magic. And uh, the other thing that uh, many AMA doctors do is prescribe drugs willy-nilly, and that also happens to be one of the practices of voodoo witch doctors. So uh, casting a spell, which yep. would be you're going to die in six months, and giving drugs. What's been your observation along these lines as far as the attitude of the doctor? Well, the attitude of the doctor has a tremendous amount to do with whether people get well, and beyond that, whether they even live or die. Uh, I'll give you an example of how this works. This very close to the voodoo uh, spell casting thing that you see in shamanism and, and pre-industrial cultures. One of the great cardiologists in this country, uh, a man named Dr. Sam Levine, uh, was conducting a clinic in, where heart patients came at a major medical school a woman came in who had a disease of a heart valve, and this woman was doing quite well, although this was a really a severe problem. She had been uh, stable for many, many months. And so she was in into the heart clinic just for a routine visit. Dr. Levine came in and uh, listened to the woman's heart very quickly. He was in a tremendous hurry and looked at one of the residents, the doctors in training there, and said, T.S., well, TS to him meant tricuspid stenosis. He was telling this doctor, look, <laughs> this is the condition. Listen to it well. You know, this is a great example of this. You can learn something here. Well, the woman there, and then Dr. Levine was off. The woman heard these words, and to her, TS meant terminal situation. <laughs> and so she completely terrible. misinterpreted this. Within a few minutes, this woman went into congestive heart failure right on the spot. Her lungs filled with fluid. She had to be admitted to the hospital. And they tried to find Dr. Levine to come in and give some words of assurance. This woman revered Dr. Levine. He had mm. taken care of her for years. They couldn't find him. And within an hour, the woman was dead. This is a profound example of a curse. Black it was magic. unintentional. Right. He didn't mean that. He mm. didn't know that she took a, a wrong interpretation of this. But this is the way that doctors can really do immense harm with... Uh, thoughtless words and actions. I, I had heard a story, uh, maybe it was from your talk from the Learning Enrichment Center in Portland. Uh, I'm not sure where I heard this, but uh, it was along the same lines. And I'm wondering if there, if there isn't a way to be more open. The, the story I, I was thinking of was the, the, a, a doctor started being you know, more open with his patients and telling them what he really thought. And, and, uh, and you know, he was trying to be more positive. That's it. He was trying to give a very positive spin to everything and his diagnosis. So uh, after a while, someone came along and sued him because he hadn't given them the odds uh, on the negative side. Was that your story? Yes, it was. This was an actual court case. I'm told that this came out of California. And uh, this is a very interesting example uh, of how the legal uh, problems can mm. really do immense harm in our medical system. And I think that unless the legal climate changes, we're going to continue to see these sort of problems every day. This particular doctor uh, did not like this rehearsal of every bad thing that could possibly happen following the procedure. And so he believed that this set people up for failure, that it actually put right. these bad ideas in people's minds and they would have complications uh, around a, a certain type of x-ray or a scan or lab test. And so he was bent on going in the other direction. And so the poor guy got sued by the patient because the patient had one of these complications and the doctor hadn't spelled out all of these grim details ahead of time. <laughs> so you see the legal aspects cast a cloud over the behavior of physicians and I think uh, this needs to be redressed tremendously in our culture. Well, it almost falls into the area of the frivolous uh, lawsuit. I saw a comedy sketch last night where uh, there was two football players in the locker room, and uh, one was with his lawyer, and he said, you'll talk to my lawyer. It was the, the center talking to the, the quarterback, and he said he was suing him for sexual harassment because every time he bent <laughs> over, he got touched. So he'd been touching me inappropriately for so long, I'm suing you. And then later, after the quarterback walked off in disgust, he sat down with his lawyer and he said, "Oh, uh, we're, now we'll." She was planning ideas that will now sue the other players for tackling you, for roughing you up. <laughs> and you know, it borders on the ridiculous. Oh, it is ridiculous. 
Uh, it really does, and I think that it can be carried over into the the medical realm too. But here's here 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 we have these doctors who are trained, and they want to help. They may be ignorant about a lot of things, but they definitely want to help their patients. They don't want to kill them. And uh, here we are, you know, suing them left and right for malpractice, and I don't think that's appropriate either. Um, I'd like to get a little bit into uh, your views on the, the national health care situation. I know uh, recently uh, Bill Clinton attempted to nationalize health care, and that, that idea failed. Um, what are your views on, um, on, on national health care? Well, actually, uh, this may sound a little uh, confrontational, but I, I'm pretty much a big fan of the health care crisis, to tell you the truth. I think that within this crisis, we have the chance to back up and say, look, what have we been trying to do in this country for a long time? Uh, it hasn't worked. We have the chance to ask why it hasn't worked. And so out of this, we can begin to construct, I think, a very viable and a different kind of health care system that focuses not on treating people after they get sick, but on preventing disease before it actually happens. We're speaking with Dr. Larry Dossey, the author of Healing Words. We have to take a break right now, but we'll be right back right after this. Stay with us. And we're back. This is Steve Fryer, and you're listening to the Inner Light Program. And with me on this show is Dr. Larry Dossey, the author of Healing Words, currently touring the country and promoting the power of prayer. And uh, Dr. Dossey is currently the co-chairman of the panel on mind-body interventions, on, and the Office of Alternative Medicine, National Institutes of Health. He's also the executive editor of a new journal called Alternative Therapies. And uh, for the break, we were talking a little bit about the politics of prayer. And uh, it occurs to me that over the last few weeks, I've been hearing quite a bit of a debate on most of the uh, talk shows on television and radio. And they've been debating the, the, uh, the right of uh, individuals to pray in school. And it seems to me there's a corollary here in the uh, in the individual's right to choose what kind of medical uh, health care they can have, and you know how much they want to get into traditional style versus homeopathic or allopathic chiropractic, herbalism, shamanism, or just pure faith, as many of the Christian scientists desire. Why should we have to uh, uh, submit? To one style, it seems to me the AMA is nothing more than a than a trade union to protect the interests of a certain group of individuals who practices a certain style of medicine. I'd like to know your views on that. Well, my views are very simple. I think people ought to have the ability to use whatever works. And uh, as it turns out, there are a lot of therapies in this country that doctors know very little or next to nothing about, but yet which seem to be effective in various uh, problems. Uh, you're exactly right. There has been a dark shadow side to a lot of uh, the activities of organized medicine that wants to criminalize activities, uh, forms of therapy which doctors are not familiar with. I think that this has gone too far. I think this has been a shameful aspect of organized medicine in this country. Uh, it's dark and dirty politics, and I think that it's ending. A sign that it is coming to a close is the establishment within the National Institutes of Health in 1992 of the Office of Alternative Medicine. I've been crucially involved with that effort. And what we have uh, done is to fund a series of grants looking at things that, at areas of practice that would never have crossed doctors' lips. They're ashamed to say <laughs> things like homeopathy and chiropractic really? and all of this. Our goal is to test these things to prove whether or not they work. Some will be proved to be effective, some will not. But at least we'll be able to put on the table for the American public and for organized medicine, scientific proof one way or the other about the effectiveness of these things. Now, isn't isn't it kind of uh, like throwing a little pebble in in the ocean? The kind of money that they're throwing at this Office of Alternative Medicine, I heard, it is is very next to nothing. Well, it's 0.01 of one percent of the total <laughs> NIH budget. This is a homeopathic level of funding, really. <laughs> Uh, so you're right about that. But I think that the uh, main effect of this office is not in the amount of funding that it's had, but in the legitimizing effect of the office on the idea of alternative medicine. Now, now what, what evidence have you seen that is that positive? I mean, it, to me, it almost you could almost get paranoid about it and say, maybe they're just doing this to draw all the, the quacks and the weirdos, that in, in their terminology, out of the closet so they can find them. And track them better, you know. Well, that and, and then later throw them in, uh, you know, in the lockup. Well, I think that uh, 
that may be the strategy of uh, some of the people at the NIH. I wouldn't be surprised if that were the case, but I think that that's a, certainly a very minority point of view. Uh, what's the evidence? Well, we're already beginning to see evidence trickle in from some of the studies that uh, certain alternative medicines, uh, forms of therapy, are effective. For instance, there was recently a study in homeopathy, a control mm -hmm. study showing that homeopathic remedies decrease the rate and the duration of diarrhea, which is in children, which is one of the great causes of infant mortality mm -hmm. in the world. Uh, that's only one example. That was a controlled study yes, with uh, placebos and all that? That's exactly right. And uh, so we are coming to uh, some scientific evidence. So I don't think that the people, the skeptics and the cynics within organized medicine, are going to be too happy about some of those outcomes. Um, it seems to me that the health care insurance providers should be intensely interested in alternative healing for the simple reason that it works better and faster in many cases, and it also can cost a lot less. Why isn't there a greater emphasis uh, on this, you know, in in the realm of insurance companies? Have you had any interaction with insurance companies? Well, as a matter of fact, the insurance companies are looking at this area intently. They are now? Yes. When did that begin? Well, it began uh, a couple of years ago. One of the most sensational examples of this is the fact that three of the major insurance companies in this country have begun to reimburse for alternative treatments to heart disease, which currently kill more Americans than all the other diseases put together. Wasn't that the uh, Dr. Ornish uh, study? That's exactly setup? right. Dr. Ornish took a group of men who had severe heart disease. Many of these guys had bypass surgery operations mm -hmm. already put them on a triple component program cons consisting of group therapy, group interaction, diet, and exercise, and he showed that the cardiac lesions, the coronary artery lesions, actually begin to regress and go away. Now, this saves a tremendous amount of money. A bypass operation costs forty to fifty thousand uh, dollars. You can do this kind of intervention to reverse and cure the heart disease at a fraction of the cost. Uh, Dr. Ornish uh, presented this data to Hillary Rodham Clinton's Task Force on Health Care Reform. The insurance companies got a hold of it, and as I mentioned, there are currently three major insurance companies who are reimbursing for this kind of program. Listen, if you want to figure out where medicine's going in this country, you better follow what the insurance companies are doing. They don't have any philosophical indigestion over any of this stuff. They don't. Uh, no. They want to know the answer to one question. Does it work, and does it save money? And so if you look at what the insurance companies are doing and where they're headed, you can get a real clue about where modern medicine is going to go. I had heard that there was an insurance company in California that was actually starting to uh, fund or pay pay out uh, monies for people that wanted to do alternative therapies. Are you familiar with that company? Yes, I cannot remember the precise name of that insurance company, but I have heard about it. Uh, and these, this particular insurance company is experimenting with reimbursing people for preventive medical practices. Like what, meditation? That's exactly right. <laughs> Weight reduction, stopping smoking, and so mm -hmm. on. Well, maybe that, that'll point the, the way for the future. It, it feels like we're on a, on a cusp of, of, a, of a revolution here, and it seemed to me that the insurance companies should be the ones driving this thing, and I'd always wondered why they had never paid attention until now. They're beginning to. So that's good news. Um, it seems to me that the key here is that we're starting to return the power to the individual instead of saying that uh, disease and illness is something that comes upon you from some unknown place and you're a helpless victim. In other words, we're turning that around or starting to say that we're not helpless victims, that we can participate in our own health. And maybe it all started with the, the movement toward uh, exercise and the health clubs and all of that on the physical level, but now it's starting to move into the emotional and, and physical levels. Uh, what's, what's your uh, opinion on that? My opinion is that it's about time we, be, we <laughs> began to take that view. I was fascinated by a report that came out about three or four years ago that was government-funded, a report called Healthcare 2000. And this project looked at the top ten causes of death in America. And they were able to show that seven of the top ten causes of death were largely preventable. Now, this is an amazing kind of statistic. It suggests that 70% of the major causes of death can be handled in large degree by what people decide to do themselves in their health styles, in their individual health care initiatives. And so this sort of uh, destroys this idea that you need a cadre of professionals out there telling you how to fix your life. This is up to you. 
And I think that it's time people began to get that message. And I think people are getting it. I'm glad you brought up uh, the exercise uh, example. You know, I can remember back a few years ago when physicians referred to people who were interested in exercise and diet as health nuts. We actually <laughs> had a pejorative <laughs> phrase to describe these people. You know, we suggested that they were psychologically and emotionally imbalanced. And so look how that has changed. Now, you know, we physicians act as if we discovered exercise and nutrition. When in fact, we, uh, I'm sorry to say, we did just about everything we could 20 years ago to retard these developments. So you see, a lot of people are upset that medicine is slow to change and change never comes. And it may not come as fast as we want it. But if you go back only a couple of decades ago and compare it then and now, you can see that medicine really is a rather dynamic social factor. Are you familiar with um, some of the, uh, the people that are going around with the ability to diagnose uh, illness? They're almost like human CAT scans. Have you ever met anyone like that? Dr. Norman Sheely has been working for the last eight or ten years with a woman named Carolyn Mace. And they, she was on my show and they, she, they came out with a, a, a co-authored book called The Creation of Health. And they cite case after case after case that he would call her up long distance and say, the name is Susan Smith and give me your reading on her. And if, if uh, he, she did a good job, she'd call him back with another case. And over the years, they developed a strategy. They would then develop a holistic approach to healing each case. And if the person were to participate and do what they asked in terms of changing their lifestyle or their diet, they generally improved their health and uh, became even better. But if they didn't, they would usually die because many people go to Dr. Sheely because he's, um, he's a, a doctor of last resort. He's a, one of the, uh, the great pain doctors in this country. So I was, just, uh, I was curious if you had ever worked with uh, medical intuitives. Actually, I am familiar with Dr. Mace, uh, Dr. Sheely and Carolyn Mace's work, and it absolutely fascinates me. I've looked at this data, and in the first 100 cases, uh, Carolyn is 93% accurate in her long-distance mm -hmm. diagnoses. Uh, this is pretty good, given only the patient's birth date and the first name, right. which is all the information he provides her. And uh, I must say, I don't know any internists who are that accurate in the early <laughs> stages of diagnosis, even with the, the, the aid of laboratory studies, histories and physicals, and so on. This, to me, suggests that there are human ways of knowing that go beyond the rational, linear framework, which we which rely on in medicine. And you may be interested, Steve, to know that there is a young uh, physician, a radiologist on the staff of Duke University Medical Center, uh, who is doing currently a scientific study on this remote, intuitive, distant diagnosis. So there. I'd say hang on to your hats. This game is really getting interesting. It's, it's really well, it, heating up. It would certainly, uh, if you could train people to do that, which Carolyn Mesa has told me she's setting up a school to train people in intuitive diagnosis, and she says it could take three to four years to really learn it well. But if, it, if it's something you can actually learn to do, then they should be teaching this in medical school someday. You know, it makes sense. Yeah, it, it does make sense. For a long time, I've had the hunch that a lot of doctors do this unconsciously and they don't own it you know you it, it sounds as if you're sort of schizophrenic to say that you can do this sort of thing <laughs> and it uh, uh, doctors look at you, your colleagues look at you funny if you say well I just kind of know the diagnosis here but a lot of doctors are noted for their intuitive uh, ability mm -hmm. to just make brilliant diagnoses doctors but develop reputations I mean they're just better than anybody else at this and I think that a lot of these docs unknown to themselves are calling into play some of these intuitive ways of understanding and knowing that completely bypass uh, analyzing data, crunching numbers, and making diagnoses with the aid of CAT scans and uh, laboratory numbers and so on. Well, it seems to me it's important at this point in our, in our development as uh, human beings that uh, we have CAT scans and MRI so that we can confirm those intuitive diagnoses because otherwise it would be nearly impossible until we had an autopsy. <laughs> Listen, if I have a fancy, tough illness to diagnose, I'd really like Carolyn to uh, get in on it. Mm -hmm. But you know what? I'd like to test the accuracy of her diagnosis with a good, solid battery of lab tests and CAT scans, too. So uh, I'm not suggesting that we throw out all the CAT scanners. I think that there's a place for both of these approaches in diagnosis. Well, it would seem to me that if you're, you're dealing with a mystery, 
you don't know what's wrong with a person, and you could get to it a little faster, a little bit more pointedly through an intuitive, then it would make sense that that would be the appropriate place, but then back it up with the testing as well. That's a very smart point of view, I think. Sure, let's cone down and let's look in this area. Let's don't subject the patient to every known right, test. Right. Let's be selective. I'd like to have you speak to us uh, when we return about the efficacy of prayer and uh, what you've found about that. We'll be right back with more of our discussion right after this. This is Steve Fryer, and I'm with Dr. Larry Dossey, the author of Healing Words. And just before the break, we were going to get into the efficacy of prayer, and I wanted to know your experience along these lines. My experience has to do with uh, individual cases on the one hand and scientific studies on the other. Now, if you look at individual cases, you can see frequent examples where people have some pretty terrible diseases such as cancer. Uh, they don't get orthodox treatment or they get substandard treatment, not enough to make a difference in the disease, but they get prayed for and the disease goes away. Now, for that person, the cure rate for the prayer, for them, appears to be 100%. Okay. It's curative. Now, if you look at this scientifically, though, what you'd want to do is to get a huge number of patients, such as uh, Dr. Randolph Bird did at a, a major hospital in California. Right, I heard about that. 400 patients with heart attacks. You treat all of them with standard treatment for heart attacks in the coronary care unit, but half of the people get prayed for and half don't. Now, if you look at the power of prayer. In that kind of instance, you can show that there are fewer deaths in the prayed for group. Mm -hmm. They don't require as much potent medication such as diuretics and antibiotics. And in this particular study, in this prayed for group, nobody wound up with a tube down the throat being hooked up to the mechanical ventilator. The more dramatic. In, that's right. The, uh, dr the dr that's really a dramatic intervention. Right. While in this group that didn't get the prayer, there were 12 people who had to have the mechanical ventilator and the tube down the throat and this sort of thing. So this is one way you look at the power of prayer and, and try to judge how it works. And it, it, these are double-blind, randomized, controlled experiments. And so you can really show that there are some dramatic treatment differences. Is that the largest, uh, most controlled study that you know about? Uh, it is the largest controlled study to date that I know of. What's going on currently? We should probably know about that. Do you know any, of anything under development? Yes, there is a prayer study going on currently at the University of New Mexico Medical School in Albuquerque. Dr. Scott Walker is looking at a study in drug and alcohol, re drug and alcohol rehabilitation. Uh, this is a controlled study. You have a lot of people getting the same sort of treatment, but half of the people get prayed for. This is a controlled, randomized, double-blind study, uh, and people need to pay attention to that because he's already been approached by every major television network <laughs> in the United States. They want to bring their cameras mm -hmm. there and film prayer in action. He's run them off and said, come back when I finish my study, but I can promise you that when the results are released, this will probably be front page news uh, on every newspaper in the United States. When do you think that'll uh, that'll be done? A matter of months. Great. You know, I, I often felt that it would be interesting to do a, a controlled study on the the different types of prayer in in uh, not so much in the sp spindrift style, which is done on cells and plants and things like that, but uh, with real human beings. Let's take uh, AIDS AIDS patients, for instance, or, or a certain type of cancer, and then let's take and randomize them. Let's say a hundred and then to, uh, have the various prayer groups uh, working with different styles of prayer to see what is the most uh, effective type of prayer. Uh, let's have some Baptists, let's have some uh, Presbyterians, let's have some Catholics, some Buddhists, some religious scientists, whatever, you know, Christian scientists. Let's see which kind of prayer actually works the best. But then you could actually get into individuals. Uh, there was a man a few years ago, I think he died in 63, uh, Joel Goldsmith, who used to heal people left and right, and he would he would sit there as a practitioner. People would come in his office, and he'd say your name, uh, and he didn't really want to know much more about them because he felt that the more he knew about their problem, the more he would have to work in his own uh, prayer mind mm -hmm. to overcome mm -hmm. the appearance of the problem. So he would just sit there and know uh, their perfection. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's probably the ultimate form of prayer. But let's let's get that tested. Uh, well, do you know of anyone trying to do that? Well, it sounds like you're describing the prayer Olympics. You know, uh, <laughs> let's have a pray off. Why let's not? <laughs> it's better than to me. That would be more fun than than the Indianapolis 500. I understand. I agree totally. I yeah. think we need to do things in this realm, and maybe it sounds a little ridiculous to call it the the prayer Olympics, but uh, it hasn't been done. 
you know. Yeah, that's true. And maybe after it's done, it would seem uh, that they're all the same or whatever. But well, let me give you a little warning about that kind of study. If you look at the effects of uh, prayer in the laboratory, uh, so far the picture that comes out of this is that there is no correlation between people's private religious beliefs and the effect of the prayer. Uh, no one has proved to be more effective than anybody else in terms of their pri the way they line up with their religions. Uh, this fact alone has driven a lot of people in the religious right up the wall. Uh, <laughs> they've been convinced for a long time that they, their prayers work better, that God answers only their prayers and not the prayers of heathens. But this isn't borne out in the laboratory. Mm -hmm. I, I like this because, again, it, it sort of says that nobody's got a lock on prayer and the prayers of many different religions are answered when you put it to the test. What do you think is the, the most important factor in prayer, in, in, in uh, effective prayer, in your experience? Well, I just mentioned that it isn't the particular religion that you hold. That isn't the most important issue. As a matter of fact, to state it once again, that doesn't seem to be a factor whatsoever. But if you look at these experiments, it begins to look old-fashioned. Love seems to be the critical factor. And if you take away the empathy and the compassion and the deep caring, the love of the person doing the praying, these experiments don't work very well. And I think we're getting back to where we were uh, hundreds of years ago when we say, look, if you want to heal somebody through prayer at a distance, you've really got to care. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is, sounds like sort of what your grandmother told you, you know. I mean, why do we need science to, to tell us what most people know intuitively? Well. I love the fact that science is agreeing with some of this age-old wisdom and folklore of the importance of love. And so I'm delighted that we see love coming to the fore as a crucial quality in healing, particularly in these prayer experiments. What um, should one do, in, in your experience, when prayer doesn't seem to be working? Well, I think that it's just great if you use your prayer to make the cancer go away or to heal a heart attack and so on. But uh, People need to understand that there are tremendous benefits to prayer beyond whether you can use it as a tool like that. The greatest benefit of prayer, to my mind, is that it reminds us that there's something about us that's connected with the absolute, with the transcendent, with mm -hmm. God, Goddess, Allah, Brahman, the Buddha, whatever your term is. And this fact suggests that there's something about us that really is immortal and eternal. So if people use prayer to make the cancer go away, and it doesn't happen, and you die, well, so what? You just may have to settle for immortality. So I think that uh, the, the larger lesson is that prayer reminds us of our connection to the absolute, that there's something about us that's already divine, that's already immortal and eternal. So good luck if you pray for the cancer, and if it doesn't go away, uh, it's not go a tragedy. Go to your doctor. It's not a tragedy. <laughs> At least keep working with uh, traditional methodologies. I'd like to know, in the in closing here, what recommendations you can make to other doctors regarding prayer? Pretty simple. I, I just say, let's practice what we preach. We say that we're scientifically oriented physicians. We honor science uh, and, and so on, and that we're objective. My challenge to my colleagues is to do science. Look at the data. Let's line up. Uh, let's walk our talk. And let's be uh, courageous enough to look at the data, to put this information on the table, and let it speak to us. Let's engage it. And then let's, let's, let's talk about this publicly, come out of the closet with regard to these ideas, and begin to speak the truth about what this data actually shows. If we can do that, I think we'll see that medicine can be transformed. It will become a lot more humane. It will feel, feel better. And my contention is that it will work better. Dr. Dossi, I want to thank you for being here on the Inner Light program, and I wish you the best of luck with your latest book, Healing Words, and I'm sure it will help to heal many people. Thanks, Steve. And I can't wait for the next book and, uh, and to see the latest test results. Great. Thanks for being here. Thank you.